All right, Revelation chapter 13. And last week we kind of uh, got into a little bit of introduction into this. We'll get into a little bit more specific of the study of it tonight. Revelation 13, we'll start in verse 1 and read through the first 10 verses. We'll pray and, and get into the study. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And it was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds, and tongues, and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. God, we pray that uh, as we come to it, your Holy Spirit will speak to us and teach us, draw us closer to you, give us a, a proper understanding, help us to, to divide it rightly, that we may come to know Jesus is better, for we ask it, uh, in his name. Amen. All right, so we began to study, we, we talked a little bit last week about this uh, vision that God is giving John on the Isle of Patmos, and um, as John stands on the sands, figuratively, of that turbulent and fearful sea, he sees riding out of it, uh, or rising out of it, what uh, is described as a monster, and um, the Bible uses the word beast, and then the description of the mixture conglomeration of several different animals obviously this is a uh, this is figurative uh, it's symbolic uh, but it is a specific individual <clears throat> and uh, uh, so remember the 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 sea represents the people we talk about the sea of humanity we, we saw that in uh, I believe Revelation chapter 17 uh, last week uh, we got ten horns, and uh, each one wearing a crown, seven heads supporting those ten horns, and uh, then we, we see this uh, uh, this creature himself uh, emerges from the sea. The Bible talks about his body looking like a, a leopard, uh, <clears throat> his feet are like the feet of a bear, uh, his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and uh, his heads have the name of blasphemy and he speaks blasphemies or blasphemous things against God and against God's dwelling place and against those in heaven. Again, the sea, evidently, as I mentioned before, the sea of humanity, the sea of nations in the world. And, and then it talks about the, the sands here. Um, I believe that talks about the, the many people that make up the nations, but it, it also is... Uh, Indicative of the source. Uh, turn with me to Genesis 22. Genesis 22. So one of the uh, difficult things about studying the book of Revelation is if you don't have a familiarity with the rest of the Bible and a very good familiarity with the major prophets in, in the Old Testament, it... Uh, you miss out on the meaning of a lot of things. So Genesis 22, uh, let's see, I wrote down verse 17 here. And so here we find God interacting with, with Abraham. Genesis 22, um, uh, 
Let's look at verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. For because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed, notice this, as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So in, in, uh, in verse 17 there, it tells us that God is going to bless two types of seed from Abraham. Or in other words, two types, two categories of descendants from Abraham. And there's descendants, it says, as the stars of heaven. That would be a spiritual Descendants. Those of us that are that are saved, we've been spiritually grafted in to Abraham's family. Uh, sometimes for vacation Bible school or often for uh, Bible camp, the kids sing this song called "Father Abraham had many sons." You are one of them, and one, of, and so am I. And and usually that song gets sung when the song leader makes the mistake of saying, "Does anybody have any favorites?" And one smart aleck kid will raise his hand and say, "Oh, I want to sing Father Abraham." And the rest of the room usually are either very enthusiastic or they groan in unison. Uh, there's not much of an in-between place there. It's kind of like when you get around to Christmas and somebody says, I want to sing all the verses to the 12 days of Christmas. And then everybody wants to throw a hammer at that person. Uh, but they're enjoying it thoroughly. So that, that's kind of talking about saved people spiritually being related to Father Abraham. But then there's also... so. When it talks about a, a heavenly seed or the stars, that's a spiritual descendancy to Abraham. And then when it talks about the sand, that's a physical or literal descendants from Abraham. And so that would be uh, the Israelite people are, are the, the rightful, uh, the legitimate descendants of Abraham. And then you have, uh, you have uh, through Ishmael, another line, but that line was, was rejected. By God. Here it says, uh, God is saying, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you very uh, greatly because you have not withheld thine only son Isaac, which meaning uh, God is saying, Isaac is the son that I recognize of Abraham's descendants. And it's through that lineage that he was promising that uh, uh, all nations of the world will be blessed. Well, by the way, uh, everybody on the planet has received a blessing as a result of Jesus coming into this world. And that's what that blessing uh, is all about. Amen. And so, um, <clears throat> when why did we go all the way back here to see that? Well, when we get into Revelation, it's just, uh, it's just an earthly, an earthly people out of which this, uh, this beast arises. There's no heavenly people mixed in there or no no uh, Christian people, uh, biblically spiritual people. Now the world will be full of spiritist people at that point, uh, and, and I guess they might refer to themselves as spiritual people, but they will not be biblically spiritual people. And, and so that's the, the sand pictures the many people of the world, uh, or we would say worldly people. And, and not inclusive of, of the saved people. And so Satan sees this sea of the nations in their restlessness, political agitation. And, and it seems like anymore there, there's, if, if you get a little bit of rest and peacefulness in this region of the world, somebody gets upset and they say, that's just too much, uh, that's just too much rest and peacefulness. Over here, we better invade somebody. We better we better do something horrific, and and it quickly is more than offset. And so somebody may go in and say, "Nope, we've got to we've got to put a rest to that. We've got to put an end to that. And you can't be invading other people's countries, and and you got to leave them alone." And 10, 20 years later, that gets put down. And then over here, somebody else says, "Nope, I'm going to invade this country. I want to expand my empire, or whatever." And, and now, 
and I don't know if there's more restlessness than ever, but there's more restlessness than I ever remember in my lifetime. And, and we have created, in some ways, our country has created very recently opportunities for greater restlessness. Now, the country I was born in, in Colombia, they had, uh, for quite some time while I was there, they had uh, uh, communist factions trying to take over the country. And there was a war between the communists and the government. The communist guerrillas, at the time that I was there, it was the uh, M19s. Yeah, M19 was the big group. After I left, another group kind of came into power, and, and I, I don't know where they came from. They were never mentioned when I was there, but they became the big name. But what happened was one of the presidents got into power, and he said, I'd like to, I'd like to make peace with them. And, and so he met with their leaders. He said, fellas, he said, uh, can we just stop killing each other? And what he meant was, could you just stop killing us? Because uh, they were having a hard time even finding where these communist rulers were hiding out. Because they had a lot of sympathy from the people in general. And so uh, they, would, they would make an attack and then they would retreat into the forest. And, and uh, the military would come by and they'd say, did you see where they went? And people would say, no. I don't know where they went. Uh, just leave. They were sympathetic to them. They kind of cover for them. And uh, so they said, well, why don't you just give us this little kind of forsaken part of the country? We'll just hang out there. We'll leave you alone. You leave us alone. And we'll all live happily ever after. And so the government said, fine, you can have that part of the country. And that happened to be the part where I was born. Uh, I wasn't there. This has been more recent history. And uh, so did that bring peace to the nation of Colombia? No, it didn't. It brought a little bit of rest for a little while. And what it did was they went to that region of the country and they said, all right, fellas, they're going to leave us alone for now. Let's build up our armament. Let's use this time to train while they're going to leave us alone. And, and, we'll, and they came back stronger than ever. Um, and so there's a lot of turmoil and upheaval. And sometimes it looks like there's, like there's, oh, there's some peace finally going on there. Uh, don't let that fool you. Uh, the Bible said there would be wars and there would be rumors of wars. In other words, war is going to be on the headlines and it's going to be on people's minds. It's going to be on people's lips and and it's going to be talked about at the around the water cooler at, at businesses and things like that. And and uh, when when you have a severe enemy, uh, one of the worst mistakes you can do is give them billions of dollars worth of equipment and just hand it over to them. That's a horrible mistake. And and don't think that that there's not going to be a a, a price in the counted in the in lives of humans that's going to be paid as a result of that, not just a monetary price. But anyways, um, there's when John is looking out, he's seeing a lot of turmoil, political turmoil in the world. And when you have political turmoil somewhere, it, it gives an opportunity for a strong leader to come into place and say, follow me. I'm going somewhere. I'll fix this problem. And, and, Many times throughout history, if you study it, you find that's how a dictator came to power in their country. Their country had problems, they had turmoil, they had just things were falling apart, and this leader says, I've got the solutions to this, just follow me, and he leads them in, into what he is proposing as a solution, and generally he leads them into battle against another country. Well, this is going to be over the whole world. And so out of this, is going to arise a leader that says, follow me, I'm going to fix it all. We just all need to come together and all go one direction. And, and so <clears throat> such a man rises up and he stands upon the earth to proceed in this final struggle for supremacy. It's clear that it is a man, but he's in league with Satan and he's energized by Satan. Now the heads... <clears throat> speak of kingdoms or empires. The horns speak of a, a confederated power. 
and the crowns represent ruling authority. So the restless world that has gone through such a turmoil is going to be seeking such a leader. Israel, years ago, decades ago now, already said, if there's a man that can give us peace, we'll follow him. We'll follow him. And it seems like here on our side of the world, president after president after president sits down and, and the earliest president I remember in my lifetime was Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter had the Israeli uh, prime minister come over and he sat down with, with the Arabic people and, and they signed some pieces of paper and they said, all right, yay, there's going to be peace in the Middle East now. And there was for just a little bit. And uh, it seems like just about every president in my lifetime has had such meetings, hosted such meetings, or tried to be a part of such meetings, and tried to bring peace to that region of the world, and they haven't been able to do so. Not anything lasting, not anything that's, that's ongoing uh, for an extended amount of time. And so imagine that situation around the world, and the people grow tired of the war and the restlessness, and they say, you know what, if, if somebody could just give us peace, isn't that how our current president got elected? I'm going to bring a less harsh tone to the Oval Office, a more kind and peaceful and gentle attitude and, and tone. And people said, yeah, we want a less harsh tone. i tell you what I wouldn't give for a mean tweet about right now and $2 a gallon gasoline. Uh, <clears throat> I'd endure a mean tweet to bring gasoline and for there to be baby formula back on the shelves and and bread that's less than four dollars a loaf and 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 or or bread to be back on the shelves. Uh, but anyhow, so this leader is going to use that's one of the tools he's going to use to take control. Uh, and of course, he has the backing of Satan himself to run interference for him and to to energize him and to turn people towards him. Remember, there's there's going to be Christians here, but none of them are going to be a part of this man rising to power. They're going to be in his way. And so this is a uh, this is a man who will represent to the unregenerated mass of humanity what appears to be a solution to their problem. And keep in mind, the bigger the problem the more drastic a solution people will accept. And so it is in the best interest of, of this beast for the problems to be big problems. And, and so keep think about the, the party that said, never waste a crisis. In other words, always, whenever there's a crisis, use that crisis to seize power. Don't let it go to waste. Make sure you use it. Make sure you do everything you can to use that to your benefit. Don't waste the price. That, that's the same mentality that the beast is going to be using, or this, part, this particular beast. The final political ruler of this world. Now, when he's destroyed, that's going to be the end of, of, of world government and the sovereignty of, uh, of nations as we know it uh, even now and even during that period. This vision, and we won't take the time to, 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 I keep looking up there, isn't that clock still running? Uh, and it is not. Uh, so I have to do like this. And what's that mean to a Baptist preacher? Nothing. Uh, but uh, uh, it coincides. You can read Daniel chapter 7 and study the prophecy there. And that coincides with the time period that we're looking at here in the book of Revelation. It's also further borne out in Revelation chapter 17. So seven, uh, chapter 17 again, gives us a view of this same time period, but kind of the, the camera's pointed at a different location in chapter 17, if you will. I guess that's a, a way to describe it. Uh, so um, we, if, who's it pointed at in chapter 17? Well, it describes uh, the whore of Revelation uh, <clears throat> and uh, the, the, the scarlet woman riding this beast or, or working alongside. So the seven heads as I said, are seven kingdoms. Of those seven, five had already fallen. As God is writing this with John, 
and in, uh, I'm not saying that he's with John and hey, let's write this together. I'm saying John is the pen in God's hand, and so God is using John to write this. Five kingdoms had fallen. They were in one kingdom, and one kingdom was still to come. So the, the five fallen would be ancient empires that preceded the apostle John. In other words, the Egyptian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, and the Greek Empire. Now, during John's day, or while John was being used of God to write this, the Roman Empire was in power and in control, and they ruled a large part of the world at that point. Uh, and then, so that would have been number six. The one that is yet to come is that great final political power that will rule the whole world. And a one world government, a new world order, and ordering everybody into that one political control. Uh, and it will be presided over by the Antichrist himself. Um, so all of these beast images that we see here in chapter 13 are symbols that describe, uh, in these first 10 verses, they describe this man, the Antichrist with a capital A. So keep in mind, this, this monster is a specific individual, uh, a specific person, uh, the one who becomes a ruler of this world system. Uh, let's see, chapter 19, back in Revelation, uh, chapter 19, and verse 21, it says, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of the, his mouth, and all the fowls were filled uh, with their flesh. Let me see. That's not the verse I was looking for. Uh, verse 20, I'm sorry, not 21. Verse 20, let me correct that in my notes. Uh, it says, The beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had uh, received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So when it, when we have pronouns for the beast and for the false prophet, they're singular. And then when we have a reference to both of them, it says both. It doesn't say all of them. And so it's not a, it's not, the beast doesn't represent a government or a government system. It is an individual. He him, uh, those are his pronouns. He, he's not confused about that. Um, and, and really, you ought not to join anybody in their delusion if they are confused about that. That does not help them. You know, just as if somebody who has cancer and they say, no, I don't have cancer, I don't have cancer. And if you say, that's right, buddy, you don't have cancer. You have not helped them at all. You have joined into their delusion, into that lie, and that has not helped them. They will be a slave to that. What they need is the truth, because once you know the truth, the truth is what sets you free. And really what they need is the truth in Jesus, for he is the way, the truth, and the light. Now, <clears throat> so, these both were cast alive. These are two specific individuals. Um, let's see, 1 John, I need to, I need to hasten, 1 John chapter 2. Uh, and verse 18 1 John 2 18 says little children it is the last time in other words he said we're in the we're in the last days and as ye have heard that antichrist shall come even now are there many antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time he said we know we're in the in the final days there's a whole bunch of little antichrists running around and so we know there's going to be one big main Antichrist. We would say an Antichrist with a capital A. He said, but right now there's a whole bunch of little ones running around. We would say they're with a small A. Uh, and, and who are these that are Antichrists with a small A? Well, they're the ones that deny. They are against Christ. That's what anti means. And there's a, so, so think about that. Uh, even at this point in time, within the first few years 
of the church having been established here, there was already a lot of antichrists in the world. Don't believe for a minute that there are fewer now, 2,000 years later, than there were back then. There are just as many, if not more, now. Uh, everybody's scared to death to call the Pope Antichrist. He is. He absolutely is. He has exalted himself above God. Uh, he has declared, when, when he puts on a special magic hat and sits in a special seat, then whatever words come out of his mouth supersede the very words of God. Wow. They, they, they have a, they have a, a word, for, I think it's a ex cathedra or ex catheter or something like that. Uh, and when he speaks the, in, in that uh, mode, then, uh, then whatever he says nullifies. Whatever, if there's a, a conflict between what he says and what it says in the Bible, He's higher. Now the Bible says that there's one thing that God has elevated above his own name, and that's his own word. So when you elevate yourself above the word of God, you have elevated yourself above the very name of God. And you've placed yourself above God himself. So guess what? That makes you anti-Christ. Uh, and there are a lot of biblical scholars that... Uh, would say they believe the Pope, whatever Pope is in power at the time that, that John gets the vision for the book of Revelation, he is the capital A Antichrist. I don't know, maybe yes, maybe no, uh, is, is possible. But it's at least with a small A. My mom asked me if I thought Obama was the Antichrist. I said, I don't think he's the Antichrist, but with a capital A, but with a small A, yes. Why would I say that? Well, he quoted the Quran more than he ever quoted the Bible. And the Quran is not pro-Christ, it is anti-Christ. And so uh, it is a false doctrine, a false gospel. So this ruler here in, in the first 10 verses of Revelation 13, this antichrist, I, I need to say, he is a specific individual person. Now, he has a personal attractiveness to him. And maybe that's uh, uh, in, a, in appearance and looks, uh, or maybe it's just a, a fascination of people being intrigued with him. People will be naturally drawn to him. Uh, they will hear him speak and they're going to say, Wow, that's amazing. And it won't matter what he says. I mean, he might give a speech and say, You know what? In order to fix the problems, we're going to have to take control of all of the banks and empty all of your savings accounts. And if we do that, we can we can get this all straightened out. And people are going to say, oh, that's such a good idea. We're, he's going to fix all our problems. And we won't have to worry about that pesky savings that we've been building up for 30 years. Uh, we, won't have to, we won't have to worry about our retirement. He's going to make our house payment. He's going to pay my phone bill. I'm going to get free internet for the rest of my life. I can just sit back at home and, and, and play these video games. And, and people are going to think that. And they're going to be attracted to whatever message he says. They're going to interpret that to be whatever they want to hear. And Satan has been working on that and perfecting that, that ability uh, for quite some time now. They will see what to them is the most fascinating, the most magnetic mortal man that has ever walked across the stage of humanity. And that's going to be the man that is the Antichrist. Now verse 3, back in, in chapter 13 of Revelation, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Some big injury happens uh, to this individual. One of his heads is wounded as it were to death. Now, as I said, the heads represent different kingdoms. The kingdom that was in power at the time was number six. That was the Roman. We think the Roman Empire is over. The Roman Empire is not completely gone. It just looks like it is. Uh, see, as it were, it indicates, I, I believe, that he didn't actually die, 
but it looked like he died. Regardless, Satan's power raises him back up again. He does have some some powers to work wonders and miracles. And you can look that up in uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9. So remember, the Antichrist is not a system. He's an individual. Uh, and this individual receives a wound. Perhaps it's the kingdom that receives a wound because of the heads, uh, representing the seven different kingdoms uh, throughout the history. Um, and all the world is going to wonder, wow. And they're going to be impressed. And they're going to think this is just the, the, the best and the most wonderful thing. And, and uh, you know, after believing, or I'm sorry, after denying the truth, and I say the truth with a capital T, G, uh, Jesus himself, the world is going to believe a lie. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 11 and 12 say this, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. For, for what cause? Because they received not the truth when it was presented to them. And it says that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So those who deny Christ's miracles, Christ's power, they deny Christ himself, are going to believe and accept a false Christ. Uh, and hasn't it always been so? Haven't men always been more willing to accept a false religion rather than the true religion? Wow. Haven't they always been more willing to sacrifice to some false god than to the true god? It's amazing how many people will spend hundreds of dollars every month just on entertainment. And if the preacher asks for an, for an extra $50 one month, He's just after my money. But you don't have a problem at all spending 80 bucks for internet, just for internet, so that you can spend another 50 bucks on Netflix and another however much for Disney Plus and however much for this network and that network. And you got to get this. Oh, I got to get my HBO and I got to get my Sin to the Max and, and, uh, and all these different ones. And you start adding all that up, it comes out to more than 50. Just to get internet. You might you might get internet for as low as 50. If you try really hard and look uh, look very carefully, you can find it. So long as it's available in, in that area. Uh, and it's available in, in more areas than, than cable internet even. But uh, they'd, rather, they'd rather sacrifice to those things. They'd rather sacrifice to their own pleasure than to sacrifice to the true God. They're more willing to serve a false religion than a true religion. And you look at the false cults. And you think, well, we live in, a, in an educated, enlightened time. And, and people that are, that are uh, victims to cults, they must be the dummies, the, the, the poverty-stricken. Uh, not always the case. You know, if I was going to start a cult, I wouldn't go after the poor people. <laughs> they don't have any money. There's, I watched a, a few months ago a documentary on a cult. I, I don't remember. It's been about a year or so ago I watched it. I don't remember the name of it. Uh, I don't know. It had it had a weird, I keep wanting to say Nexium, but I think that's a pill for allergies or something like that or, or stomach heartburn or I don't know. Uh, but it was something like that. And instead of a U, it had a V. It was some weird thing. And it had all sorts. It had uh, celebrities. I mean, movie stars caught up in this thing. People that everybody thinks they're the really smart ones. And, I mean, they had been dragged into it. And their bank accounts got dragged into it right along with them. Uh, so don't think that, that cults are a thing of the past. I mean, I remember just a few years back, there was a whole group of people that thought, here comes a comet. It's going to pick us up as it goes by. And, and they actually believe that. False cults and how quickly and how easily these cults take hold on the world. They'd rather believe a lie. I, I was watching uh, a documentary very recently. Uh, ancient aliens. 
And uh, one, one of the men that believes life on earth started, and I, I guess in a technical way, life did start on somebody who's not from here. <laughs> so if God is not from this world, that would make him alien to this world. But he he's not gray-skinned and had big bulging eyes. Uh, that's, that's not God. But uh, uh, you can read the Bible and find out what God is like. He said, our DNA is far too complex for us to have evolved. So somebody must have come from somewhere else and placed life on this planet. Because just studying the, com the complexity of DNA and the information that's contained in, in one little strand of DNA, and, and you have a full DNA code in every single cell of your body. And so you can take one cell out of somebody's body and, and the whole DNA is, is right in there. And all the computers of the world have a hard time decoding and, and, and dealing with that much information. He said, there's no way we could have evolved. He's absolutely right. And he said, therefore, we must have come from little men on flying saucers. They must have visited here and, and seeded this planet with its life. And people would rather believe that than to believe in the beginning, Amen. God created. Amen. So, oh, no, no, it couldn't have happened that way. They would rather believe a lie. Dr. Stan Sweeney told me about being on the airplane next to a man once and he uh, asked the man what he did. He said, well, I'm, a, I'm a, a college professor. What do you teach? And I think the man said he taught geology or something like that. And uh, he said, oh, I'm a science teacher myself. At the time, Dr. Stan Sweeney was teaching science at a Bible college. Extremely overqualified for that. The man had 17 years of college and university education himself. He was one of the premier scientists for NASA. Uh, he helped with all of our Apollo lunar launches. I mean, he had uh, his hand in all that stuff. The laser guided missiles that were used in the first Gulf War, he helped develop that guidance system. His, his name is on the patent. The US government holds the patent. Uh, so he's not allowed to sell it, but he, he is named there. Is that uh, the joystick control for the uh, space shuttles and, and the layout of the cockpit. He was in charge of all of that. So literally a rocket scientist. And uh, he starts talking to this guy, and this guy doesn't know his credentials. He thinks, oh, he's just teaching in some little, some little rinky-dink Bible college out here in, in the West. And uh, he said, you know, I had a, a group of my students with me. We went up to the top of Pike's Peak, and one of them found an amazing thing. He found a shark's tooth up at the top here, thousands of feet above sea level. He said, what do you think about that? He said, what an odd thing. He said, well, actually, we talked to the guy, and he said, people find shark's teeth all over the place on top of this mountain. And that public university professor figured out, I know where he's going with this. He's going to try to tell me there was a flood over the whole planet at one time, and Noah and his family survived in that ark. And he said, well, I don't believe there was a worldwide flood, if that's what you're getting at. He said, well, how do you think that shark got up there? He said, well, I think there would have been a localized flood. He said, the problem is, that mountain is very steep, and water runs downhill pretty quick on a mountain that steep. How did a shark swim upstream? How did hundreds and maybe even thousands of sharks swim upstream to the top of that mountain, dump their teeth before the water all ran down that mountain? He said, and here's what the man said, I would rather believe I would prefer to believe that there was an invisible force field, a shield of some sort, that held the flood in place long enough, just around that mountain, and, and extended out to the ocean, long enough for those sharks to make it up to the top of that mountain and lose their teeth, which is not uncommon. Sharks do that all the time, and, and they lose teeth, and another rope comes in, and then they lose that one, and they, they're just constantly producing teeth. Teeth machines is what those things are. 
the Bible says that there's science falsely so called and that men would be willingly ignorant of the truth. And that man proved it. I would rather believe, I would prefer to believe. I don't want to believe what the Bible says. And you look at the, the false quotes, the false teaching, how long it takes to win people to Christ, but how easy and how quickly they'll believe a lie and go the wrong way. And the world is going to say, who is like unto the beast? Wow. Have you ever seen anybody like him before? And, and, and people, they, they get enamored with political figures. And people fell in love with JFK. Wow. What a great, what a great man. What a great orator Bill Clinton was. What a great, what the great communicator, Ronald Reagan, and people what, just just fell all over themselves. And, and Obama is gonna pay my house payment. And, and he never said those words. If you could conceive of all the attractive features of all the world leaders and pack them into one, you would end up with this beast. You think of the magnetism of JFK or more recently Ronald Reagan and uh, the power of the speech of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the ability of Winston Churchill uh, and, and, and the dictatorial power of Lenin and Stalin and you combine that with, with everybody else that you can think of that's been a, a very powerful political leader. Look at what Hitler convinced his own people to do. I mean, even the religious people of their country, as the trains would go by the churches and the people on the trains would cry out to help, the, the people in the churches would say, let's just sing louder so we don't have to listen to them. As they go to the camps and, and onto the ovens and gas chambers. And none of that power and charisma will compare to what this beast is going to have. And uh, so no wonder they wondered after him. We'll pick up in verse 4, Lord willing, next week. Let's stand. We'll close with a word of prayer this evening.